Hello everybody, welcome to me, me and you, Alex Ryder, book four, Evil Strike. Chapter eight, Rue Britannia. Do you realise, Alex? Jack said. Picasso, Picasso sat exactly where we're sitting now, and Chagall and, Sal- and Salvador Daly at this very table at this very cafe. All the big arti- artists came here. What are you trying to say, Jack? I was just wondering if you'd like to forget this whole adventure thing and come with me to the Picasso Museum. Paris is such a fun place and I've always found looking at pictures a lot more enjoyable than getting shot. Nobody's shooting at no, nobody's shooting at us. Yet, a day had passed since they had arrived in Paris and booked into a little hotel that Jack knew opposite Notre Dame. Jack knew the city well. She had once spent a year at the Sorbonne studying, studying art, but for the death of Iron Rider and her involvement with Alex, she might well have gone to live there. She had been right about one thing. Finding out where, where Mark Antonio lived had been easy enough. She had only telephoned three agencies before she found the one that represented the photographer. Although it had taken all her charm and rusty French to cajole her telephone number out of the girl on the switchboard, getting to meet him, however, was proving more difficult. She had run, rung the number a dozen times during the course of the morning before. It was answered. It was a man, man's voice. No, he wasn't Mark Antonio. Yes, this is this was Mark Antonio's house, but she had no idea where he had, where he was. The voice was was full of suspicion. Alex had been listening, sharing the receiver with Jack. In the end, he took over. Listen, he said. His French was almost as good as Jack, but then he had started learning when he was three, old, three years old. My name is Alex Ryder. I'm a friend of Edward Blasier. He's an English journalist. I know who he is. Do you know what happened to him? A pause. Go on. Go on. Go on. I have to speak to Mark and Daniel. I have some important information. I just considered for a moment. She tell this man. Tell this. Tell the, this man what he need. It's about the May and Clay. He said. He said. The name seemed to have an effect. There was another pause along this time then. Come, then come to La Palette. It is a cafe on the Rue de Seine. I will meet you there at one o'clock. There was a click as the man hung up. It was now ten past one. La Palette was a small bustling cafe on the corner of a square, surrounded by art galleries. Waiters with long air, ape, with long white air, aprons were sleeping in and out, carrying tray laden, tray la- trays laden, laden, laden with drinks high above their heads. The place was packed, but Alex and Jack had managed to get a table right on the edge, where they would be most conspicuous. Jack was drinking a glass of beer. Alex had a bright red fruit juice, a syrup de grenadine with ice. It was his. It was his favorite drink when he was in France. He was beginning to wonder if this, if the man he had, he had spoken up to on the telephone was going to show up, or could he be here already? How were they going to find each other in the crowd? Then he noticed a motorcycle sitting on a beaten up, Piaggio one two five cc motorbike. On the other side of the street, he was on the other side of the seat street. He was a young man in a leather jacket with with black curly hair and stubble on his cheeks. He had pulled in a few minutes, few minutes before, but hadn't dismounted as if he were waiting for someone. Alex met the eye. There was a flash of contact. Um, contact. The young man looked puzzled, but then he got off his bike and came over, moving warily as if afraid of the trap. Are you uh, Alex Ryder? he asked. He spoke English with an attractive accent, like an actor in a film. Yes, I wasn't expecting a child. What, is it, what difference does it make?
Jack demanded, coming to Alex's defence. Are you Mark Antonio? she asked. No, my name is Robert Guppy. Do you know where he is? Do you know where he is? He asked me to take you to him. Guppy glanced back at the piago, but I only but I only have room for one. Well, you can forget it. I'm not letting Alex go on his own. It's all right, Jack. Alex cut in. He smiled at her. It looks like you get to visit the Picasso Museum after all. Jack sighed and she nodded. Oh, fine, she said. But take care. Robert Guppy drove through Paris like someone who knew the city well or who wanted to die in it. He swerved in and out of the traffic, he ignored the red lights and spun across intersections with the blare of har- car-, car horns echoing all around. Alex found himself clinging on for dear life. He had no he had no idea where they were going, but realised there was a reason for Guppy's dangerous driving. He was making sure they were they were being followed. They slowed down on the other side of the scene, on the edge of Ma- Marais, close to Forum de Horis. Alex recognised the area. The last time he had been here, he had called it he called he had called himself Alex Friend and had been a company and had been accompanying the hideous Miss Dellenbosch, Miss Dellenbosch on the way to the Point Blanc Academy. Now they slowed down and stopped in a street of typical of typically Paris, Parisian houses, six stories high with solid looking doorways, a tall frosted frosted windows. Alex noticed the street signed, signed Rue Britannia. The street went nowhere, and half the building looked empty and dilapidated. Dilapidated, indeed, indeed, the ones at the far end were shored up by scaffolding and surrounded by wheelbarrows and cement mixers with a cement mis- mixers with a pa- with a plastic chute for debris. But there were no workmen in sight. Guppy got off the bike. He gestured at one of the doors. This way, he said. He glanced up and down the street one last time. Then led Alex in. The door led to an inner courtyard with old furniture and a dang- and a tangle of rusting bicycles. In one corner, Alex followed Guppy up a short flight of steps and through another doorway. He found himself in a large, high-ceilinged room with whitewashed walls and windows on both sides and a dark wood, wood floor. It was a photographer's studio. There were screens, complicated lamps on metal legs and silver umbrellas. But someone was also living here. To one side was a kitchen area with a pile of tins and dirty plates. Robert Guppy closed the door and a man appeared from one from behind one of the streets. He was barefooted, wearing a string vest and shapeless jeans. I guessed he must be about fifty. He was thin, unshaven, with a tangle of hair that was black, black mixed with silver. Strangely, he had oh, he only had one eye. The other was behind a patch. A one-eyed photograph. Alex couldn't see why not. The man glanced, glanced at him curiously and spl- spoke to his friend. C'est le qui est téléphone? Qui? Are you Marc Antonio? Alex asked. Yes, you said you are a friend of Edward Pleasures. I didn't know Edward hung out with kids. I know he's a daughter. I was staying with him in France when... I hesitated, hesitated, hesitated. You know what happened to him. Of course I know what happened to him. Why do you think I'm hiding here? He glanced, he gazed at Alex. Quizzily, his one, one good eye. Slowly, evalu- slowly evaluating him. You said on the f- f- telephone that you could tell me something about the Mayan crate. Do you know him? I met him two days ago in London. Cray is no lumber- longer in-, in London. It was Robert Guppy who spoke. Leaning against the door. He, had a, he, has, a so- he has a software plant just outside Amsterdam in the st- in Sloderdijk. He arrived there this morning. How do you know? We're keeping a close eye on Mr. Clay. Alex turned to Mark Antonio. 
You had you have to tell me what you and the little pussy found out about him, he said. What story were you working on? What what, the, what was the secret meeting he had here? The photographer thought for a moment, then smiling quickly, showing nice tones, saying teeth. Alexander, he muttered, you, you're a strange kid. You say you have information to give me, but you come here and you only ask questions. You have a nerve, but I like that. He took out a cigarette. A golosis and screwed it into his mouth. He lit it and blew smoke into the air. All right, it is against my better judgment, but I will tell you what I know. There were two bar bar stools next to the kitchen. He perched up on one and and invited Alex to the same. Robert Guppy stayed by the door. The story that Ed was working on had nothing to do with the main play. He began at least not the star suite. Ed was never interested in the entertainment business. No, he was working on something much more important. A story about the NSA. You know what it is? It's the National Security Agency of America. It's an organization involved in counter-terrorism. Terror- Espionage and the protection of information. Most of its work is top secret. Code makers, code breakers, spies. Ed became interested in a man called Charlie Roper, an extremely high ranking officer in the NSA. He had information. I don't know what he got that this man, Roper, might have turned, tra- turned traitor. He was heavily in debt, debt, and addict, an addict. And I addict drugs, Alex asked. Mark Antonio shook his head. Gambling, it can be just as destructive. It heard that Arthur well, was here in Paris and believed he had come to, t- to sell secrets, either to, to the Chinese or, more likely, to the North Koreans. He met me just over a week ago. He'd, we'd work together often. He and I, he got the story. He and I. He got the side, I got the peaches. We were a team, more than that, we were friends. Mark Antonio shrugged. Anyway, we found where o- out where Opa was staying and we followed him from this hotel. We had no idea who he was meeting and if he had told me, I would never have believed it. He paused and drew on his colourless. The tip glowed red, smoke trickled, trickled up in front of his good eye. Roper and Roper and fall into the restaurant court. La Tour de Argent. Argent. It's one of the most expensive restaurants in Paris, and it was the main clay who was paying the bill. We saw two of them two of them together. The restaurant is high up, but it has wide glass windows with views of Paris. I took foot photographs of them with a telescopic lens. Clay gave up an envelope. I think I contained money, and if so, it was a lot more. It was a lot of money because the envelope was very high seek. Wait a minute! I should what? What would a pop singer want to with someone from the NSA? That is exactly what Ed wanted to know. The photographer replied. He began to ask questions. He might have asked too many because the next thing I heard. Someone had tried to kill him in St. Pierre, and that same day they came for me. In my case, in my case, in my in that my case, the bomb was in my car. If I had turned the ignition, I wouldn't be speaking to you now. Why didn't you? I'm a careful man. I noticed a wire. He stopped out the cigarette. Someone had also broke into my apartment. Much of my equipment was stolen, including my camera and all the photographs I had taken at. Lord, la tour de argent. It was no coincidence. He paused. But why am I telling you all this, Alex Ryder? Now it is your turn to tell me what you know. I was on a holiday in Saint Saint Pierre. Alex began. That was as far as he got. A car had stopped out somewhere outside the building. Alex hadn't heard it approach. He only became aware of it when its engine stopped. Robert Guppy took a step forward, raising a hand. 
Mark and Tony had some tap around. There was a moment's silence, and I just knew it was the wrong sort of silence. It was empty, final. And then there was there was an explosion of bullets, and the window shattered, one after other. The glass falling at a great slab sunk to the floor. Robert Garpy was killed instantly, thrown off his feet with a series of red holes, st- red holes stitched across his chest. A light bulb was hit and exploded. Chunks of plaster crumbled off the wall. The air rushed in, and with it, with it came the sound of men shouting and footsteps stamping across the courtyard. Mark Antonio was the first to recover, sitting by the kitchen. He had been out of the line of fire and hadn't been hit. Alex, Alex too shocked. Two were shocked, but in uninjured. This way, the photographer sh- shouted and propelled Alex across the room, even as the door burst open with a crash of splintered wood. Alex just had time to glimpse a man dressed in black with a machine gun cradled in his arms. Then he was pulled, but and then he was pulled behind one of the screens. He had no idea, but there was another exit here, not a door, but a jagged hole in the wall. Mark and Tony had already climbed through. Alex followed. Up, Mark and Tony pushed Alex ahead of him. It's the only way. There was a, there was a wooden staircase, seemingly un, unused, old and covered in plaster, du- plaster dust. Alex started to climb three floors, four f- with Mark and Tony just behind. There was a single door on each floor, but Mark and Tony urged uh, on. He could hear the man with the machine, machine gun. He had been joined by someone else. The two killers were following them up. Them up. He arrived at the top, another door bar- barred his way. He, he reached out and turned the handle out at the moment. There was a burst of gr- gunfire and Mark Antonio grunted and curved away, falling backwards. Alex knew he was dead. Mercifully, the door had opened in front of him. He tumbled through it, expecting at any moment to feel the rake of bullets across his shoulder, shoulder bed. The photograph, had sa- the photograph had saved him falling between Alex and his pursuers. Alex had made it onto the roof of the building. He lashed out with his heel slamming the door shut behind him. He found himself in a landscape of skylights and chimney stacks, water tanks and TV aerials. The roofs found the full length of the Rue Britannia with low walls and thick pipes div- divided, dividing the different houses. What had Mark Antonio, in- Mark Antonio intended? Coming up here, he was six floors above the street level. Was there a fire escape, a staircase leading down? Alex had no time to find, to find out. The door flew open and the two men came in, moving more slowly now, knowing he was trapped. Somewhere deep inside Alex, a voice, Alex, a voice whispered, Why couldn't they leave him, leave him alone? Alone. They had come for Mark Antonio, not for him. He, he was nothing to do with this, but they knew they, they, they would have their orders. Killed the photographer and anyone associated, associ- associ- associated with him. It, matter, it didn't matter who Alex was. He was just a part of the package. And then, and then he remembered something he had seen when he ended the Rue Britannia. And suddenly he was running without even being sure that he was going the right direction. He had the clatter of machine gun fly and black tiles disintegrated centimetres burning right behind his feet. And it's another burst. He felt a spray of bullets passing close to him and part of a chimney stack shattered, showering him with dust. He jumped over a low partition. The edge of the roof was getting, cl- was getting closer. The man behind him paused, thinking he had nowhere to go. Alex kept running. He reached the end and launched himself into the air. To the two men with the guns, in guns it, to the two men with the guns, it must have seemed that he had jumped to a certain death on the pavement six floors below. But Alex, Alex had seen building works, scaffolding, cement mixes, and orange pipe design to carry builders. They bristled from different from the different floors down to the street. The pipe actually considered us of a series. Of buckets, each one one bottomless, interlocking like a flume at a swimming pool. Alex couldn't judge his leap, but he was lucky. For a second or two, two, he felt his arms and legs brawling. Then he saw the entrance to a pipe and managed to steer himself towards it. First, his outstretched legs, then his hips and shoulders entered the tube perfectly. The tunnel was filled with cement dust, and he was blinded. He could just make out the orange walls flashing, flashing past. The back of his head, his sides and shoulders were battered mercilessly. Mercilessly, he couldn't breathe and realized with a sick dread that if the exit was blocked, he would break every bone in his body. The tube was shaped like a stretched-out J. As Alex reached the bottom, he found himself slowing down. 
Suddenly he was spat out into the daylight. Sun, there was a mound of sand next to one of the cement mixes, and he sudded into it. All the breath was knocked out of him. Sand and cement filled his mouth, but he was alive. Painfully, he got to his feet and looked up. The two men were still on the roof, far above him. They decided not to attempt his stunt. The orange tube had just been wide enough to take him. They would have got jammed before they were halfway. I looked up the street. There was a car park, car, car park parked outside the entrance to Mark Antonio's studio, but there was no being sight. He spat and dragged the back of his hand across his lips. Then he limped quickly away. Mark Antonio was dead, but he had given Alex another piece of information, another piece of the puzzle, and Alex knew where he had to go next. Slaughter Digic Digic the Digic. A software plant outside Amsterdam. Just a few houses, how, hours on a train from Paris. He reached the end of the Rue Britannia and turned the corner, moving faster all the time. He was bruised, bruised, filthy, and lucky to be and lucky to be, be alive. He just wondered how he was going to explain all this to Jack. Chapter ten, I think. I'm just going to check. So I got, sorry, I'm not very good at remembering what chapter I'm on. Do, 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 do. No, chapter nine. Blood money. Alex lay on his stomach, watching the guards as they examined the waiting car. He was holding a pair of Bosch and Loam Prims Prism System binoculars with thirty percent magnification. Mag- magnification. Now, although he was more than a hundred meters away from the gate, he could see everything clearly. Right down to the car's number plate and the driver's moustache. He had been here for more than an hour, lying motionless on in front of the bank of pine trees, hidden from sight by a row of shrubs. He was wearing grey jeans and a dark, a dark t-shirt and a cakey jacket, which had picked up, which he had picked up in the same army supply, supply shop that had provided the binoculars. The weather had turned yet again, bringing with it after with with it. An afternoon of constant drizzle. Alex was soaked through it. Through it. Alex was soaked through. He didn't wish now that he had brought the thermos of hot chocolate Jack had offered him. At the time, he thought she was treating him like a child. But even the SAS know the importance of keeping warm. They had taught him as much when he was training with them. Jack had come with him to Amsterdam, and once again, if it had been she who had checked them into into a hotel, the time on the Herreg Erin Gratch or one of the three main canals, she was there now, waiting in the in their room. Of course, she had wanted to come with him. After what had happened in Paris, she was more worried about him than ever. But Alex had persuaded it her that two people would have twice as much chance of spotted her as one. And her bright red hair would hardly help. Reculently, she had agreed. Just make sure you get to the hot, you get back to the hotel before dark, she said. And if you pass the two in the shop, maybe you can bring me a bunch. He smiled, remembering the the her words. He shifted his he shifted his weight, feeding the damp grass beneath his elbows. He wondered exactly what he he had learned in the past hour. He was in the middle of a strange inst. Industrial area on the outskirts of Amsterdam. Slaughter Slaughter de- contained a spoil of factories, warehouses and and processing pro- processing plants. Most of the compounds were low rice, separated from each other by wide stretches of tarmac. But there were also clumps of trees and grassland as if some had tried and failed to cheer the place up. Three windmills rose up behind the headquarters of Quays. Technolog- technological empire, but they weren't the traditional Dutch models. That's the sort that w- that that would appear on picture postcards. These were modern towering pillars of grey concrete with striped stri- triple blades, endlessly slicing the air. They were huge and menacing, like invaders from another planet. The compound itself reminded Alex of an army bar of army barracks. Barracks. Of army barracks. Or maybe a prison. It was surrounded by a double fence. The outer, the outer one, topped 
with razor wire, the guard's ta- the guard towers at fifty meter intervals and a fifty meters interval intervals and guards on the trawl all around the perimeter. In Holland, Holland, a country where the p- p- police carry guns, I wouldn't surprise that the guards were armed. Inside, he could make out eight or nine or nine buildings, low rectangular white brick with high tech plastic roofs. Various people were moving around, some of them transported in electric cars. He could hear the whine of the engines, like milk, fl- milk, milk floats. The compound had its own communication center, with five huge satellite satellite dishes mounted out, outside. Otherwise. It seemed to consist of laboratories, offices and living quarters. And buildings stood out in the middle of it all. A glass and steel cubes. Steel cube. Aggressively modern in design. This might be the main headquarters, Alex thought. Perhaps he would find the May Yoon Cray inside. But how was he going to get in? He had been studying the entrance for the last hour. A single road led up to the gate with a traffic light at each end. It was a complicated process. When a car or a truck arrived, it stopped at the bottom of the road and waited. Only when the first traffic light changed, it was it allowed to continue forward to the glass and brick guard house next to the gate. At this point, a uniformed man appeared and took the driver's ID, presumably to check it on a, on a computer. Two more men examined the vehicle, checking that there were no passengers. And that wasn't all. There was a security camera mounted high up on the fence, and I noticed a length of what looked like toughened, toughened glass built into the road when the vehicle stopped, they were right on top of it, and Alex, yes, that's, there must be a second camera underneath. And there was no way he could sneak into the compound. Cray's software technology had left nothing to chance. Several tra- trucks had entered the compound while he was watching, while he would, had been watching. Alex had recognised the black clothed figure of omni-painted life. Life size on the sides of part of the game's player logo. He wondered if it might be possible to sneak inside one of the trucks, or perhaps, as it was waiting at the first set of lights, but the road was too open. At night it would be floodlit. Anyway, the doors would all, would almost be certainly or would almost certainly be locked. He couldn't climb the fences. The razor wire would see that see would see to that. He doubted he could tu- he could tunnel his way in. Could he somehow disguise himself and, and mingle? The evening shift? No. For once, his size and age were against him. Maybe Jack would have been would have been able to attempt it, pretending to be a replacement cleaner or a technician, but there was no way he could be able to talk his way past the guard, particularly without speaking a word of Dutch. Security was too tight, and Alex saw it. Right in of his eyes, another truck had stopped, and the driver was being questioned while the, ca- while the cabin was searched. Could he do it? He remembered the bicycle that was chained to a lamp to a lamp post, just a couple of hundred meters down the road. Before he had left, before he had left England, he had gone through the manual that that had come with it and had been amazed how many gadgets Smithers had been able to conceal it in and around such an ordinary object. Even the bicycle clips were magnetic. Alex watched the gates slide open and the truck could pass through. Yes, it would work. He would have to wait until it was dark, but the last. It was the last thing anyone would expect. Despite Alex, despite everything, Alex suddenly found himself smiling. He just hoped he could find a fancy dress shop in Amsterdam. By nine o'clock, it was it was dark by the search, but the search site around the compound had been activated long before, turning the area into a dazzling condition of black and white. The gates, the razor wire, the guards with their guns, all could be seen a mile away, but they were throwing vivid shadows. Vivid shadow pools across off darkness that might offer a hiding place to anyone brave enough to get, brave enough to get close. A single truck was approaching the main gate. The driver was Dutch and had drive driven up from the port of Rotterdam. He had no idea what he had what he was carrying, and he didn't care. From the first day he had started working for Quake Software Technology, he had known that it was better not to ask questions. The first two are the traffic lights. Red and and he slowed down. Then the first two of the traffic lights were red. They slowed down, then came to a halt. There were no other vehicles in sight. 
and he was annoyed he kept waiting but he was better not just to complain there was a sudden knocking sound and he glanced out the window looking in the side mirror was it someone trying to get his attention but there was nowhere there and, and a moment later the light changed so so he threw the gear stick into first and moved on again as usual, he drove into the glass panel and wound down his window. There was a guard standing outside and he passed across his ID and pla- a classic card with his photograph, name and employee number. The driver knew that the other guards would inspect his truck. He sometimes wondered why they were so sensitive, sensitive, sensitive about security after all. They were only making computer games, but he had, he had heard about industrial sabotage. Company stealing secrets. Company stealing secrets from each other. He supposed it made sense. Two guards were walking around the truck. Even as the driver sat there thinking his private thoughts, a third was examining the pictures being transmitted by the camera underneath it. The truck had been recently been cleaned. The word "games play" stood out on the side, with the only figure crouching next to it. One of one of the guards reached out and tried to open the door at the back. It was, and it should have been locked. Meanwhile, the other guy peered in through the front cabin, but it was obvious that the, that the driver was alone. The security operation was smooth and well practiced. The cameras had showed nobody hiding underneath the truck or, or on the roof. The rear door was locked. The driver had been cleared. One of the guards gave a signal and the gate opened electronically, sliding sideways to let the truck in. The driver knew where to go without being looked told. Well, after 50 metres, he branched off the entrance road and followed a narrow track that had brought him to the unloading bay. There were about a dozen vehicles parked here with warehouses on both sides. The driver turned off the engine, got out and locked the door. He had paperwork to deal with. He would hand over the keys and receive a stamp to lock it with his time of arrival. They would unload the vehicle the following day. The driver left. Nothing moved. There was there was nobody else in the airway area, but if anyone had walked past, they might have seen a remarkable thing. On one of the side of the, uh, side of the truck, the black clothed figure, cloth figure of of Omni turned its head. At least that was what it would have looked like. But if the person had looked had looked more closely, the thing that it would have realized that there were two figures on the truck. One of the, one one was painted, the other was a real person, clinging possibly to the metal panel. In, in, in exactly the uh, same position as the picture on the knee, uh, it's why it dropped silently to the ground. The muscle, it, muscle, muscles in his um, arms and legs were screaming, and he wondered how much longer he would have been able to hold on. Smithers had supplied four ma- powerful ma- magnetic clips with the bike, and these were what Alex had used to keep himself in place. Two for his hands, two for his feet. He quickly pulled off the black ninja suit he had bought, that afternoon in Amsterdam, boarded it up and stuffed it into the bin. He had been in, p- in plain sight of the guards as the truck drove through the gate, but the guards hadn't looked too closely. He had expected to see a figure next to the games player, though that was just what they seen for once. They had been wrong to see, believe their eyes. Alex took, a stock, t- Alex took stock of his surroundings. He might be inside the compound, but he had his luck wouldn't last forever. He didn't doubt that there would be other guards on patrol and other camels too. What exactly was he looking for? The strange thing was he had no real idea, but some something told him that if the Mayan Quay, the Mayan Quay went in for all this security, then it must be. Then it must be because he had something to hide. Of course, it was still impossible that Alex was wrong. That Quay was innocent. It was a com. It was a comforting thought. Thought. He made his way through the compound, he- heading for the great cube that took at its heart. He, w- he heard, w- heard a whining sound and ducked into the shadows next to a wall. As an electronic car sped past with three passengers and a woman in blue overalls at the wheel, he became aware of activity, so- of activity somewhere ahead of him. An open, a- open area, brilliantly lit. Stretch out was behind one of the warehouse a voice and the echoed in the air amplified by a speaker system. It was a man speaking, but in Dutch, and it couldn't understand a word. Moving more quickly he hurried on, determined to see what was happening. He found a narrow alleyway, but between two of the buildings and ran the full length. Grateful for the shadows of the wall at the end. He came to a fire escape, a metal staircase spiring upwards, and 
threw himself breathlessly behind his bit high bit here, but looking between the steps, he had a clear view of what was happening ahead. There was a square of black tarmac with glass and steel office, office blocks on all sides. The largest of these was the cube that Alex had seen from outside the main crate standing in front of it, talking animatedly to a man in white coat with three more men just behind him. Even for a, from a distance, Clay was unmistakable. He was the smallest person there, dressed in yet another designer suit. He had come out to watch some sort of demonstration. About half a dozen guards stood, waiting, dotted around the square. Harsh white lights were, were being beamed down from two metal lights, were, the two metal tires that Alex hadn't noticed before. Watching through the fire escape, Alex saw that there was a cargo plane in the middle of the square, it took him a moment or two to accept what he was seeing. There was no way that, to, that the plane could have landed there. The square was only couldn't. The square was only lined large enough. To, which, uh, was uh, was the square was just wide, just wide enough to contain it, and there wasn't a one way inside the compound. As far as he knew, it must have been carried here on a truck, possibly assembled on site. But what was it doing here? Yeah. The plane was an old-fashioned one. It had propellers rather than, rather than jets and wings high up, almost sitting on top of the main body. In the words, Millennium Air was painted in red, red along the fuselage or, and on the taut tail. Cray looked at his watch. A minute later, the loudspeaker crackled again with another announcement in Dutch. Everyone stopped talking and gazed at the plane. Alex stared. A fire had started inside the main cabin. He could see he could see fire flames flickering behind the windows. Grey smoke began to seep out of the phosphate, and sudden, suddenly one of the propellers caught a light. The fire seemed to spread out of control in seconds, consuming the engines and then spreading across the wing. I, I waited for someone to do something. If there were any fuel in the plane, it would surely have exploded at any moment, but nobody moved. Grey seemed to nod. It was as o- it was over as quickly as it had begun. The man in the white coat spoke in the ra- into a radio transmitter, and fire and the fire went out. It was inqu- extinguished. So we really that Ale- is that if Alex hadn't seen it with his own eyes, he wouldn't have believed if it it was there. In the first place, they didn't use water or foam. There were no scorch marks, or no and no sp- smoke. One moment the plane had been burning, the next it wasn't. It was as simple as this. I mean, it was as simple as that. Simple as that. Quay and the three men with him spent. Quay and the three men with him spent a few seconds talking before turning and strolling back into the cube. The guards in the square marched off. The plane was left where it was. Alex wondered what on earth he had got himself into. This had nothing to do with computer games. It made absolutely no sense at all. But at least he, spot, he had spotted the main crate. Alex waited until the guards had gone then, twisted out from behind the fire escape. He made his way as quickly as he could around the square, um, around the square, keeping in, in the shadows. Cray had made a mistake. Breaking into the compound was virtually impossible, so he had worried less about security on in the inside. Alex had spotted any cameras, and the guards in the tower were out looking were looking out rather than in. For the moment he was safe. He followed Quay into the building and found himself crossing the wide marble floor of what was nothing more than a huge glass box. Above him he could see the night sky with the three window windmills looming in the distance. The building contained nothing but there was a single round hole in the corner of the floor and the staircase leading down. Alex heard voice heard voices. He crept down the stairs, which led directly to a large underground room, crouching on the bottom step, concealed behind wide steel banch- banches- banisters. He watched. His the room was open plan with a white marble floor and corridors leading off in several directions. The architecture made him think of a vault in an ultra modern bank. The gorgeous rugs in the rugs in the fireplace, the Italian furniture, and a dazzling white best 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 stained grand piano. 
could have come out of the palace or out of the palace. To one side was a curving desk with three computers and a wireless printer. All the lighting was at foot level, giving the room as a bizarre, unsettling atmosphere with all the shadows going the wrong way. A portrait of the Mayan Cray holding a white poodle covered covered an entire wall. The man himself was sitting on a sofa, slipping a bright yellow drink. He had a cherry on a cocktail stick, and Alice watched him pick it off with his perfect white teeth and slowly eat it. The three men from the square were with him, and Alice knew at once he had been right all along, that Cray was indeed at the centre of the web. One of the men was Yasin Gregorovich, wearing jeans and a polo neck. He was sitting on the p- piano stool, his legs crossed. The second man stood near him, leaning against the piano. He was older, with silver hair and, and a sagging, pockmarked face. He was wearing a blue blazer with a striped tie that made him look like a minor official, official in a bank or a cricket club. He had large spectacles that had sunk into his face. As if it were damp clay. He looked nervous. The eyes behind the glass circles blinking frequently. The third man was darkly handsome. In his late for in his late in his late forties. With black hair, grey eyes and a jaw jawline that was square and serious. He was casually dressed in a leather jacket and an open necked shirt and seemed to be enjoying himself. Cray was talking to him. I'm very grateful to you, Mr. Roper. Thank you. Thanks to you. Eagle Strike can now proceed on schedule. <gasps> Eagle Strike. That's the name of the book. So all of this has got has been got to do with the book. Good Eagle Strike then. Seems like an explosion in the front cover with Alex Ryder on a bike. And I, all I can see is his butt, shoe, legs and knees. Let's come on with you. Eagle Strike. Mr. Roper, this was the man that Cray had met in Paris. Alex had a sense that everything had come full circle. He strained to hear what the two men were saying. Hey, please call me Charlie, the man spoke with an American accent. There's no need to thank me, the man. I enjoy doing business with, for, with you. I do have a few questions, Cray murmured. I saw him pick up an, ob- an object from a coffee in the eagle next to the sofa. It was ma- it was a metallic capsule, about the same shape and size as a mobile phone. As I understand, the, the gold code called Change It Daily, presumably the flash drive, is currently programmed with today's code. But if the eagle strike were to take place two days from now, just plug it in. The flash drive will now would update itself, I will explain. He had an easy, lazy smile. That's the beauty of it. First, it will burn through the security system. Then, it pick up the new goals, like taking candy from a baby. The moment you have the codes, you try and make them back to back through Millstar and you're set. The only problem that you have, like I told you, is this little matter of the finger on the button. Well, we've already sold that, Quay said. And then I may, might as well move out of here. Just give me a few me. If you just give me a me a more cu- a couple more minutes of your valuable time, Mister Roper, Miss Charlie, Mister Roper, Charlie, Quay said. He sipped his cocktail, licked his lick, lips, and and set the glass down. How can I be sure that the flash drive will actually work? You have my word on it, Roper said. And you'll cer- and you and you'll certainly pay me enough. Indeed, so half a million dollars in advance, and th- and two million dollars now. However, Cray pulled and pursed his lips. I still have one small worry on my mind. Alex's legs had gone to sleep as he crouched, watching the scene from the stairs. Slowly, he straightened it out. He wished he understood more of the- what they were saying. He knew a flash drive, flash drive was a type of storage device used in the computer technology, but who or what was Millstar and what was the e- what was Eagle Strike? What's the problem? Roper asked casually. I'm afraid you are, Mr. Roper. The green eyes in Quay's round, babyish face were suddenly hard. 
You're not as reliable as I hoped. When you came to Paris, you were followed. That's not true. An English journalist found out about your gambling habit. He and a photographer followed you to La Tour de Gargant. Gal- I held up a hand to stop Robert Walker interrupting. I have dealt with, the, with them both. But you can disappoint me, Roper. But you have disappointed me, Roper. Mr. Roper, I wonder if I, can, if I can still trust you. Now you listen to me, the man. Roper spoke angrily. We had an idea. I work with you, with your tec- technical boys. I gave them the information they needed to load the flat drive, and that's my part. All of it, all over. How you get? How you are going to get to the VIP lounge? And how you actually activate the system? That's your business, but you owe me two million, two million dollars. And this journalist, whoever he was, who doesn't he? Whoever he was, doesn't make any difference. At- at all. Blood money, Quay said. What? That, that's what they call call money, paid to traitors. I'm not traitor, Roper growled. I needed the money, that's all. I haven't betrayed my country, so quit talking like this. Pay me and what you owe me. Let me walk out of here. Of course I'm going to pay you, pay you what I owe you, Quay smiled. You have to, you'll have to forgive me, Charlie. I was thinking aloud. He... He gestured, his hand falling back limply. The American glass rattled, right and I saw that there was an alcove to the side of the room. It was shaped like a giant bottle with a curved wall behind a uh, behind a curving uh, glass door, door in front. Inside was a table, and on the table a leather atta- attached case. Your money is there. It was in there. He said, "Thank you, thank, thank you, thank you." Neither Yasin Gregorovich nor the man with the spectacles had spoken throughout all of this. But, but they watched intently as the American approve, approached the alcove. There must have been some sort of sensor built into the door because it's so open automatically. Roper went up to the table and opened the case. I heard two locks kick up. The rope and t- then Roper turned around. I hope this isn't a joke. Or a time, if this isn't your idea of a joke, he said. This is empty. Quay smiled at him from the sofa. Don't worry, he said. I'll fill it. He reached out and pressed a button on the coffee table. In front of him, in front, in front of him, there was a hiss and the door of the alcohol of the alcove slid shut. Hey! Roper shouted. Quay pressed the button the second time. For an instant, nothing happened. And to realize he was no longer breathing. His heart was beating at twice its normal rate. There was something bright and silver dropped from down somewhere that dropped down from somewhere high up into the close of the room, landing inside the case. Roper leaped it, reached in, and held up a small coin. It was a quarter, a twenty-five cent piece. Hey, what are you? What are you playing at? He demanded. More coins began to fall into the case. I couldn't exactly see, couldn't see what exactly what was happening, but he guessed that the room was like a bottle, totally sealed apart from a hole somewhere above. The coins were falling through the hole, the trickling rapidly, turning into a cascade. The seconds the attacher was full, case was full, and still the coins came tumbling onto the pile, spreading out over the table and onto the phone. Perhaps Charlie Charlie Roper had an inling, an inling, inling. Of what was ha- about to happen, he forced his way through the shower of coins and pounded on the glass door. Stop this, he shouted. Let me out of here. But I haven't paid you all your money, Miss Roper, he replied. I thought you said I owed you two million dollars. Suddenly the cascade became a torrent. Thousands and thousands of coins poured into the room. Roper cried out, bending an arm over his head, trying to protect himself. I quickly worked out the mathematics. Two million dollars, twenty-five cents at a time. The payment was being was being made in just about the smallest of small change. How many coins would there be? Already they filled all all the available floor space, rising up to the American knees. The torrent intensified. Now the Russian coins were solid, and Roper's Roper's screams were almost drowned out by the clatter of metal against metal. I just wanted to look away, but he found himself fixated, 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 
His eyes wide with horror. He could barely see the man anymore. The coin thundered down. Rip was trying to sweat them away, but as if they were, sw- they were a swarm of bees, his arms and hands were vaguely visible, but his face and body had disappeared. He lashed out with a, f- with a fist and like saw a s- smear of blood appear on the door. The toughened glass wouldn't break. The coins he used forward, filling every inch of space. There was a pile and higher. Rope, rope her was invisible now, sealed into the glittering mass. If he was still screaming, nothing more could be heard. Then suddenly it was over. The last coins fell a grave of eight million quarters. Alex shuddered, trying to imagine what it must have been like trying to have to be trapped inside. How had the American died? Had he been suffocated by the fall, falling of coins of crushed by the weight? Alex had no doubt that the ma- that ma- that the man inside was dead. L- blood money, Cray Cray's sick joke, couldn't have been more true. Cray laughed. That was f- that was fun, he said. Why did why did you kill him? The man in spectacles had spoken for the first time. He had Dutch accent, but his voice was trembling. Because he because because he was careless, Henrik, Cray replied. We can't make mistakes, not like this late, say, and it's not, it's not as if I break my any promises. I said I'd play him two million do- dollars, and if you want to open the door and count it, two million dollars is exactly what you'll find. Don't open the door, the man called Hen- Henry gasped. No, I think it'll be a bit messy, Cray smiled. Well, we've taken care of Roper. We've got the flash drive, we're all set to go, so why don't we have another drink? Still crashing at the bottom of the stairs, I squirted his tree, teeth falling, forcing himself not to panic. Every instinct told him to get up and run, but he had knew what he had to take care of. What he had seen was um, almost beyond belief, at le- but at least his mission was now clear. He had to get out of the compound, out of slaughter ditch, and back to England. Like it or not, he had to go back to MI6. He knew now that he had been right all along and that the May and Cray was both mad and evil. All his posturing, his many charities and his speeches against violence was precisely that, a facade. He was planning something that he would call Eagle Strike, whatever it was, it would take him play in place in two days' time. In a role of evolved security system and a VIP lounge, was he going to break into an embassy? It didn't matter. Somehow, he would make Alan Blunt and Miss Jones believe him. There was a dead man called Charlie Roper, a connection with the National Security Agency of America. Charlie Ellis had uh, had enough information to persuade and pers- uh, to support, persuade them to be, make an arrest. First, first he had to get out. He turned just in time to see the figure looming above him. It was a guard coming down the stairs. I started to react, but he was too late. The guard had seen him. He was carrying a gun. Slowly, Alex raised his hands. The guard just as a nice took up, rising above the stair rail. On the outside of the room, Demay and, Quay, Demay and Quay saw him, his face lit up with delight. Alex Ryder, he exclaimed. I was hoping to see, you ag- to see you again. What a lovely surprise. Come on over and have a drink and let me, and let, and let me tell you how you're going to die. Right over just the end of me to me with you, Alex Ryder. Put forth and now... We know that the Eagle Strike is actually a pro- project. It's not actually where Domain and Gray, well, this is my prediction of, this, of the book when I heard about Domain and Gray, was Man and Evil, just when we were reading this book now. I thought um, the Eagle Strike was a plan where Domain and Gray was going to get an eagle, put it under his control with a remote, remote control device, and the eagle is going to strike Alex. So that, I thought that's why it's got to call the Eagle Strike, but it's not. And this is. The perfect hero, genuine twenty twenty, genuine twenty first century stuff. So this was created last year. I mean, it could have been created a few minutes, a few day, few weeks ago, last two months. But so bye bye everyone, and thank you for listening to this.